Celebrating 44 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a follow-up on that new COVID relief bill stalled in Congress. Will there be movement soon? Plus, some say record monsoon rains in China could lead to a black swan event. In today's feature, a young man confined to a wheelchair still helps run the family farm. And meet Jenna the calf who lived. She gets her hug from this farmer every day. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. Some good things happening here and there in the economy, but not a lot of excitement yet as Congress plods toward another round of relief for struggling Americans. Farm Week's Jonah Holland reports on the navigation of those troubled waters. Last week, U.S. Senate Republicans unveiled the Health Economic Assistance Liability Protection in Schools, or HEALS Act, a $1 trillion proposal that would provide another round of national aid in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Every bill has to start somewhere. The Republicans are in the majority in the Senate. This is the starting place, and we'll get, you all will have plenty of stories to cover along the way as we have these discussions back and forth across party lines and with the administration. The debate comes months after the U.S. House of Representatives passed its HEROES Act, a COVID-19 follow-up relief package authored by the Democratic majority that tips the scales at over $3 billion. Democrats pay in the Senate's initial offer ahead of last week's looming unemployment assistance cliffhanger. We had hoped that the, uh, there'd be a bill and instead, in the, ha in the Senate, they've put together little pieces here and there and everywhere. It's pretty clear they don't have 51 votes in the Senate among the Republicans for a proposal. And uh, it's frustrating because they've dithered for three months. With the virus death toll climbing and over 4 million infections nationwide, both parties are eager for a deal. Feeling a pressure? Right now we're at a time when children are food insecure in our country. People are hungry, never thought they'd ever go to a food bank. People are being on the verge of eviction because they can't pay the rent. While the Republicans' plan excludes more funding for food and nutrition programs, various commodity groups lauded the farm-tailored aspects for the next incarnation of the Paycheck Protection Program. However, there were mixed reactions to the Senate framework that added another $20 billion for agriculture. Democrats had proposed just $16.5 billion in direct aid to farmers, but their plan would allow for expanded USDA lending and a $0.45 cent per gallon payment to ethanol producers. We're going to continue the economic impact payments that were made in April and May. Uh, that means that the average family of four will, uh, could, will get another payment of $3,400. Congress must hash out the legislative details before an August recess. GOP deficit hawks in the Trump administration are expected to seek daylight between the current stimulus and past criticisms of similar Democratic action during President Obama's tenure. China is far behind its purchase commitments on that phase one trade deal, and you will hear more about China from Zach in his market segment. But there is some good news, and Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue made it clear in a tweet just a few days ago. In that tweet, he wrote, quote, another big sale reported to China, largest corn sale to China ever and third largest to any country. Lots of potential to grow our ag sales to China. We expect a big shipping season this fall. This was the second major corn purchase in four days. This one for nearly 2 million U.S. tons. It's the largest corn sale to China in 29 years. On the other hand, farm revenue will drop this year due to COVID. At least that's what the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank says. While meat packing plants are catching up thanks to higher demand, ranchers having a tougher time. Quarantine forced many of them to cull their herds, an issue we've told you about before. But now signs point to that loss of revenue as the status quo for 2020. Experts estimate an 8% loss in livestock revenue and a 3% decline in farm income. 
The USDA says it's putting nearly half a billion dollars into a plan to modernize critical drinking, water, and wastewater infrastructure. That money will fund 161 projects serving nearly half a million people. 44 states will benefit, including Mississippi. Projects include a reservoir in Washington State, new systems in New Hampshire, and sewer services in North Carolina, just to name a few. So would you like to see a cultured and refined garden in the English tradition without having to fly across the pond? In Southern Gardening this week, Gary Bachman visits Vicksburg, Mississippi. There, believe it or not, he found a landscape reminiscent of those in the English countryside. Here's Gary. Today, Southern Gardening is in Vicksburg visiting the beautiful gardens of our friends Donna and Richie. Let's take a stroll along the path on the side of their home to look at their English garden. The first thing we come to is the 2019 Mississippi Medallion winner, Blew My Mind Evolvulus. This plant produces scores of vibrant blue flowers that last a single day. Looking down the path, we're invited in by this beautiful metal arch that frames the view of the peaceful garden inside. Clematis vine scrambles up, over, and around the structure to provide some fascinating plant interest. Entering the side garden, we're greeted by creative mass combination plantings of bright colorful annuals and perennials. Of course, the larger plants like the pink knockout roses make an instant visual impact. But I really like the small plants tucked in the corners like this orange portulaca. Just down the path, we find the fantasy caladium with its snowy white leaves, deep red magenta veining, and emerald green edging. Next to it is the low-growing lamb's ear, which is a nice companion to the caladium. Across the path, the low-growing orange profusion zinnia grabs your attention. This is contrasted by the tall blooms of the orange ditch lily that gently sway in the breeze. And in the center of it all is the multi-tiered fountain with its relaxing sound of falling water. The mixture of colors and textures makes the side garden a peaceful and attractive getaway from the hustle and bustle of life. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I hope you'll join me next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, we're celebrating three decades of the Americans with Disabilities Act. A young man in Iowa diagnosed with swelling of the spinal cord when he was just six months old. And since then, his power chair is all he's known. But that hasn't stopped him or his family. These days, he's showing Angus cattle and helping to run the farm. An inspirational story, meet Alec Gatto, coming up on Farm Week. First though, in case you've forgotten or simply didn't get to it yet, it's 2020, time for another census. The effort officially got underway on April 1st, but with COVID-19, a lot of people have just focused on other things. On August 11th, census workers will start knocking on doors to interview non-responders, but there's still time to enter your information online. It's quick and easy and part of a process Americans have been taking part in since 1790. Here's how. This isn't about today. This is about the next 10 years. Pero hoy, tú puedes hacer algo. And you can make a difference today by completing the census. The census impacts everything from hospitals, schools, and public transportation. It is more important than ever before that everyone's voice is heard. The census builds America. So the census count should look like America. Shape the future of Brooklyn. Kansas City. Tucson. Atlanta. Oregon. Los Angeles. D.C. Start here at 2020census.gov. It's important that our part of the country gets counted. Not just big cities, but small towns like ours. We need our communities to be visible so that they can get all the resources that they need. You can make a difference today by completing the 2020 census. We don't want to miss out on grants for things like public housing, infrastructure, schools, healthcare programs, and emergency medical services. Shape the future of small towns. Shape the future of the Hill Country. Complete the census today. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. 
We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Time now for the markets. A lot going on this week. Here's Zach Ashmore to bring you up to date. Zach? Thanks, Mike. Markets fluctuating, showing signs of healthy activity. What does that mean? Well, prices are getting back to normal, signifying an economic recovery, albeit slow. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, lumber regaining momentum up $44. Remember, this is building season and COVID sapped lumber production. Supplies low for now, but they'll catch up. Biggest loss, corn, closely followed by wheat. This is not entirely a bad thing. U.S. grains becoming more competitive price-wise means bigger sales. Market analyst Sue Martin tells us more. Well, I think as the dollar is moving lower, it's making U.S. commodities in general very competitive and cheaper. Um, you look at uh, wheat, you take and, and adjust that by the dollar, or you take corn. You know, looking at corn, we're running right about just a little over $3 a bushel. Um, so the dollar is having a huge impact on the decline that it's seeing. Uh, in the meantime, you know, demand is good, but... You know, wheat has had some pretty good export sales this year. We're running ahead of a year ago. Uh, so, you know, that's not negative news. So we need the export business because we're also dealing with less ethanol production compared to a year ago because of COVID-19. And so, and it's not just in the U.S., it's in Brazil. They're not using as much ethanol or biodiesel either because people are not traveling uh, like they normally would. And so, you know, we're competing against fuel, crude oil, what have you. Um, we're just in a, a very negative atmosphere, I guess I would say. But all in all, when it comes to corn, I think the bottom line is going to end up being the weather. Because remember, acres are much less than what we originally started with thinking we were going to have in uh, March on the prospective plantings. Recent flooding in China having a potential effect on the markets. This would explain their recent buying of U.S. goods despite political tensions. If the worst comes to bear, they could find themselves in an economic plunge. To explain further, once again, Sue Martin. The Yangtze River Basin has had their share of flooding. Uh, over the next week, week and a half, they should start to settle down and maybe see more favorable weather. Uh, but that area should start after the 10th of August to see another surge of horrific rains. The monsoonal rains in China have been record. And so they're catching plentiful rain. It's heavy rains moving into the northeastern part of the grain belt where you do see a lot of corn, some soybeans being raised. That's not good for that. But in the meantime, it's also moving into the southeastern part of the country as well, or the southern part of the country. Here's the thing, though. If these rains, um, the, they're worried about the Three Gorges Dam and other dams that also feed along the tributaries and what have you. But should these rains continue to kick in and remain heavy and we start to see another resurgence of these rains coming downstream to that Three Gorges Dam, the fear is that there could be a black swan situation in China where you could have earthquakes set off and they could be a five magnitude on the Richter scale, something like that, uh, because of all the weight of this water that is um, sitting on top of these tectonic plates. And if that was to happen and breach that uh, gorgeous dam, you would have 480 million people in China jeopardized. They would be lost. And so you'd lose a generation of people. But more, not more importantly, but a concern is China's agriculture would just be lost. It would be horrible uh, for them. And that's a black swan event. It may not happen. But if it does... And you put that at the same time that we're running with COVID-19 here, running with phase one, and they have to be buying, all of a sudden, is there enough to take care of them if that black swan event was to right. happen? 
Moving on to other egg issues, the ever-present ligus or plant feeding insect. Their effect on final yields and therefore the market is significant. However, there are misconceptions. Dr. Angus Catchout of Mississippi State Extension explains. Plant bugs, of course, they, they get in cotton, no doubt, but they they got just hundreds of hosts that they are that they're on. They would really rather be in those other things in the ditch banks and other stuff. If you got daisy flea bane, coreopsis, pigweed, and all this stuff, it's a better host. They would rather be there, but those hosts don't last forever. And when those things dry up, that's when they move in into your fields. And you go through these really hot dry periods like we've been for the last couple of weeks and those ditch bank hosts dry up, that's when they start flooding your cotton, migrating into your fields. Corn, corn as a, a, a definitely has an influence on ligus and especially adjacent to cotton. I will say this: a lot of people think when they look at a cornfield and the, the corn plant itself starts drying down or turning brown, that's when they're getting a big movement out of corn into cotton. That's not true at all. And we've actually tested this numerous times. When the plant bugs move out of corn is really when you get brown, dry silks. Not when the corn plant, I mean, and that's where they're at. They're on the tassels and they're on the silks. And when those dry down, that's when you get the influx out of corn. Now, corn can still be a problem just because it counts as a natural edge, just like if you was on a wood line. So you get an edge effect. You'll always get the edge effect, even, you know, as long as the corn is standing. But the movement out of corn, what we're going to get is when the silks turn brown. Sales of peanuts soaring since the start of COVID. Why? Well, as you might be able to guess, peanut butter flying off shelves as people stock up on long-term essentials. What's the market effect? According to the National Peanut Board, grocery store sales in March 75% higher than last year. Snack peanuts up 25%. That initial spike has since stabilized. In shell peanuts taking a sales hit this year due to low baseball attendance for the same reason, COVID. And yes, that's how many peanuts get sold at baseball games, believe it or not. All is not lost concerning the precarious peanut. However, new research out of Arkansas shows the legume can bring life back to battered soil. According to Andy Van Gilder of, from the University of Arkansas, fields with the sorriest soils still give good yields to peanuts, specifically those with southern root knot nematodes. Financially, nuts appear to be a growing market for farmers who can afford the specialized harvest equipment. Scott Stiles, University of Arkansas Extension Economist, says at just under $500 per acre, variable costs for peanuts are less than rice, corn, or cotton. However, fixed cost for peanut production is highest among the major crops grown in the state at $193 per acre. Total cost of production is about $692 per acre, still less than rice and cotton, and comparable to corn. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. We're still moving up, barring some potential weather pitfalls. Can't predict everything, but I say we're still improving from the massive fall in quarter one. For now. Mike? Thanks, Zach. You will love this story, as most of you know by heart. Getting an animal into the ring for a livestock show takes months of preparation and hard work. Now imagine, imagine doing all that work in a wheelchair. We celebrate 30 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act with this report from Josh Bittner. Meet Alec Gatto. The kids are always part of what goes on on the farm. We have 300 Angus cows now. Alec is right there in the mix of cows when we're working cows or whatnot. I guess Alec was probably born with the love of livestock. Get up and up. Alec was diagnosed with transverse myelitis at age six months. It's a swelling of the spinal cord is what it is. It's rare, but not uncommon. The term we use is somebody flipped the light switch. He was at daycare and his arms quit working. The babysitter called us and we rushed him to the ER. They didn't quite know what was wrong. The next morning they had rushed us to Iowa City. The doctor had diagnosed them right away with it. Oh. A lot of sleepless nights. Alec probably didn't sleep, sleep for till he was five years old over the steel. At the time, he was the youngest one at Hopkins to be in a power chair. We spent a lot of days out in John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. We actually, our first trip out, I think we spent two and a half months. That up, this, 
four, turn, turn, drive. He drives with his head, and you would think that a four-year-old wouldn't pick that up, and he did it in 10 minutes. He was right to the point where he was ready to crawl when this first happened, so he's never crawled, never walked, never, you know, the chair's all he's known. I use it every day and use it for a show. The showing, I guess, came when we had a nephew that started showing 4-H and came time to weigh in fair calves and Alec asked where his were. So how do you say no to that? And sure as heck, we got that calf to lead. Yep, seven months. So the cows have all grown up with Alec in a wheelchair also. Alec's goal is to be involved in the farm as much as he can. I just want him to be interested in the pedigree, Angus. Seven months. Yep, seven months. Seven, you said? Yep. Yeah, stop. Right now, he just wants to be the boss of the farm. He, he doesn't miss anything. He knows what needs to be done, and if it's not done right, he'll let you know. I like chasing back my mama. We actually have three kids in 4-H. That's all they do all summer also is <laughs> work calves and show calves. Well, Chad and I both showed, so it's, it's nice to see them following our footsteps. And they all love doing it. I just like to have fun, and I like to go around, like, you know, Iowa and stuff. And it's just super fun to show. The Gatto family is an incredible family. Just being around Alec and being around the show with him, he's like a true inspiration to all of us and the way uh, you can put passion and hard work and determination together and to make something good and something great into what we do. Uh, I think it's pretty neat that my siblings get the show. It just makes me feel happy. He was kind of getting stuck in the show ring because all the wood chips were piling up and couldn't get really nowhere. But he showed he had to get pushed through the ring with his other chair. And I remember I was talking with his mom. They were, at that time, they had a bar that they had zip tied underneath his chair with wheels on it. And they, were, they flipped the chair over and I was like, oh my goodness. So the next day I started the Facebook group called Tracks for Alec. Several people were interested in maybe seeing if they could help him. I grew up on a farm here in Iowa. My neighbors were national champion cattle showers. Tell me about why you wanted to be part of the Iowa Governor's Charity Steer Show. Because people asked me. When I saw the news piece when he was showing his cattle and finding it hard to drive, he would have not had the capabilities with his insurance to probably get a track chair for the day-to-day -day use. I happened to have the connection with a track chair, and we do a lot of uh, community service type things here, and that's just been the model since it's been developed. VGM was founded on the principle and auspice of uh, helping the small business community in the medical world. So I contacted his parents and asked if we could help them with a track chair. They were very receptive, just salt of the earth, nice people. So we were all there, we got it unloaded, and we were waiting for him. He knew nothing about it. And when the bus pulled up, he's very shy, so he didn't want to get off the bus because there were so many people there and stuff. Alec doesn't like to be center of attention, but once he got in that chair and got to hook a calf to it for the first time, he, he was instantly excited. Totally changed his life on the farm. Since he's got the track chair, Alec, way more independent, gets a house door open for him and out the door he goes. That was something we always wanted and our Angus family is kind of who had started it. It's the people, the experience you get to have is why we do it. Alec doesn't care whether he's first in class or last in class, and he's been both, so. For me, I feel bad, just because of uh, everybody. Everybody says how moving 
you know, how inspirational he is, and don't get me wrong, he is, but for us, that's every day, so. Look here. That's just the way he is. Alec Gatto, truly an amazing young man. Well, next week, another story of inspiration. You'll meet Rick Meister, who lost his legs in a horrific farming accident. A priest actually gave him the last rites, and in the hospital, he said his goodbyes. But he survived, and thanks to a special program, found his way back into his tractor. He says he never let the accident keep him from getting back to work. Rick Meister, next time on Farm Week. And before we say goodbye, meet Jenna. Every morning she moves at the back window until she gets an honest to goodness hug from her owner, Ryan Phillips. Just a couple of years ago, this dairy cow was born unable to give milk and was headed for the barnyard in the sky. But the daughter of the farmer where she was born found her a home at the Life with Pigs Farm Animal Sanctuary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Now she's living out her days getting a whole lot of love. Sweet story. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy.